Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately titled IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. And as part of our mission to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats, which are conversations with people who are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find all the Porch Play Chats on our website at ipausa.org. Up in that top right-hand corner, be a friend on our, I have to always remember which one it is, be a friend on our Facebook page, follow us on our YouTube channel. No, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our Instagram page. Oh my goodness, all this technology stuff that I, you know, yeah, anyway. Um, and magically, Every Monday morning, a new Porch Play Chat will appear in your feed. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm president of IPA USA. And with me on the porch is Rebecca Nymick. And Rebecca, I just am, I've just lost. Hold on just a minute. Okay, Deb, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, introduce yourself for me because I lost the the sheet. So oh, sure, so sure. Far. Um, so my name is Rebecca. I am a certified child life specialist uh, at a large children's hospital in Philadelphia. So in my day-to-day -day work, I meet a lot of different patients and families who are really coming into the hospital setting, facing a myriad of stressful, overwhelming, traumatic experiences. Uh, and I help patients and families to process their feelings through a variety of different modalities. Um, and especially in regard to play. Uh, I really believe deeply in the power of play as a healing modality. And I find that it's it's really not only supportive for patients and siblings, but also for caregivers who, you know, come into the hospital setting and really do feel a sense of helplessness and are seeking guidance kind of in the best ways to support their child their child that's in the hospital, but also their child or children that are at home and wondering what is happening. And um, so um, that's my day today. And in my spare time, I, I enjoy a little bit of a quiet slowdown. Um, and I like meditation and exercise and just being with my family. Um, a lot of the hard work that we do with children and families really humbles us. So I think at the end of the day, spending a lot of extra time with my family can be really helpful. And, um, and healing, and right? And that? healing. So yeah. I found it. Sorry, I don't know what happened. So um, Rebecca is going to talk to us today about playing through a trauma-informed lens in the hospital setting. And so she sort of told us, and did you know I'm in near Philadelphia? I'm in King of Prussia. Oh, I didn't know that. I was just out that way the other day. That's so funny. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so I, I thought you were in Oklahoma. So see how we find each other. No way. I just was in King of Prussia at uh, Maggiano's. We had lunch. So Oh, yeah. Um, Maggiano's well. is a great Italian restaurant, just in case anybody <laughs> wants to know. So um, Rebecca's going to talk to us about what is trauma-informed play and how she actually does that with these families. So are you at Children's Hospital? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, who I know there's not many um, different hospitals through Philadelphia, so it's probably easy to identify. <laughs> yeah, so uh, but it's important. This it this is important work in thinking about the support systems that need to be in place with children and families when they're coming into a situation where um, things are not always happy. And so I'm I'm I think this is a really needed deep dive into this conversation and this topic and I'm so happy that you're here so thank you go forth Rebecca sure absolutely um so today we'll talk we'll begin by talking a little bit more about what is trauma-informed play uh, in the in the child life sector and often in the hospital setting and people who interact in early childhood education as well have heard the phrase and are familiar with trauma-informed play um, and it is exactly as it's spoken it's being informed about the child, the things that they are currently going through, but also the things they've been through and the things they might potentially go through in their life that kind of come together to build the scope of who the child is through those sort of really challenging experiences and the things, the things we still have to do while also recognizing what's gonna be a challenge for them because of the things they've experienced. Um, so trauma-informed play is considering how a child's previous experiences 
have really impacted the way they view themselves, their environment, and the world around them. Within mm -hmm. the hospital setting, before you can even really begin to set up a play experience for a child, you really have to take a moment to understand and appreciate the child on a really deep level. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, kind of doing your research first uh, in order to make the play experience an opportunity that's filled with safety, security, and a lot of joy for a child. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way that I like to talk about trauma-informed play and knowing a child is to break it down into the acronym of ART, A-R-T. Mm -hmm. So the way that I will kind of explain it today and open up the floor is thinking of the A as assessment, mm -hmm. R as relationships, mm -hmm. and then the T, I did it as a uh, type of play and selecting the type of play that you're going to use. And um, so a lot of what I'll talk about is my experiences in the hospital setting, but a lot of the this sort of art play as an art form acronym um, can really be supportive in any environment that you're working with children and you know that there's trauma or stress related to previous or current experiences. And so, and, and, and so I want to I want to ask a question about the assessment piece. So is when the children are coming in in the intake process, is there is there assessment just through observation? Do you look at their medical records? I'm just curious where that assessment piece comes from so that you understand if they have, you know, especially medically induced trauma because they've had so many surgeries or so many interventions, right? So I'm curious, we'll break it down one letter at a time because I think yeah. that's important too for everybody. I like the ART acronym. Sure. It's a little easier to remember it that way for sure. Uh, a lot of times when I am initially meeting a patient and their family, of course, I'll do a dive into their chart in order to sort of see if they've had any previous experiences. I will also look in the chart to see if anybody from my team knows that child or has worked with them before too, because okay. we'll get into a little bit later, like familiarity with relationships is important. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes I will get messages when a child comes in of someone who does know them and has reached out to me and has said, this is what I know about the child this is what is happening. This is what has previously happened before. Mm -hmm. um, in assessing a child, I'll look at the chart. I'll connect with other people who may potentially know this family. And then mm -hmm. I do a straightforward assessment of the child. I go in, I meet the patient, and I meet the family. Uh, sometimes in the setting that I work in, it's a little bit more difficult because there's more adaptability that has to happen if the child isn't able to move from their bed or mm -hmm. they're really tired or they're recovering and they're in a lot of pain. And um, so there's definitely moments for sort of assessing, are they ready for play? Or mm -hmm. like, just maybe they are ready for play and it needs to be a little bit more adaptive for the things that they need in the moment. Sometimes if I go in the room and there's a sibling there, I automatically think, hmm, could this child use some intervention? Could they use a little bit of play to help them process what's going on with their sibling? Mm -hmm. um, you really want to think about the things that impact a child. I collaborate a lot. We'll talk about that in relationships with parents mm -hmm. um, in my assessment to discuss what I what I think is going to be the best way to draw that child in mm -hmm. before they feel comfortable enough to play with me. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you think about that similar in the early childhood classroom, we always, we hope, have teachers who are keen observers who have talked to the family about what are your what is your child interested in, what do they like to do, what do they don't like to do, and then who can pick up on those interests of the child and create these play opportunities in the room, not that are directed by the teacher, but opportunities that are available so that children almost feel a sense of connection and relationship building with that educator because, oh, oh, look, they're doing something that I really enjoy and I want to play over there. And so that just strengthens that relationship. So yeah, you can't just go in cold turkey and say, right. what do you want to right. play with? <laughs> and you know, part of it too is understanding a little bit more about why the child is at the hospital and what that principal reason is, especially if they've not ever been hospitalized before. Mm -hmm. uh, 
recently I worked with a child who came into our intensive care unit with a severe dog bite. Oh. And okay, so I'm I'm not gonna bring a, a soft blanket with dogs printed on it. Right. Uh, I'm not gonna, she's only three, so I'm not gonna bring um the little people set with the dogs for the dollhouse. Right. You know, like right. we're actively thinking about how we can set up a play session. And sometimes it just begins by looking at what things could potentially be triggering for this child. Oh my and God. if they are triggering, can we safely trigger those things to process them? Or mm -hmm. do we need to back up a little bit more? And so there's, even in a snapshot assessment, there's also a lot of like wild cards and things moving in my head professionally on what's going to be the best and and who, what, when, where, why, and how we can do all of this play together. Oh, I think that's just fascinating um, and, and horrifying for a child. You know, that one of the big things that we ask is if the child has had trauma, what is it so that we don't set up scenarios where we're triggering anything unless it's time and they can work through it in their play. But whoo, um, that's a, it's a big job. Definitely. Uh, so some of the questions that I often ask in regard to kind of assessing what's actually going on, um, I will consider the age of the child. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will think about what their attachment level is to their parent mm -hmm. or who their parent is. Maybe the parent is a grandmother or is an aunt or it's an uncle and they don't have connection to their biological parents for some reason. Mm -hmm. Try if I can sensitively to dig a little bit deeper because that might also be where trauma lies mm -hmm. on switching households or foster care or adoption and different things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, has the child had previous hospitalizations? Mm -hmm. Do, does the child who is admitted, is this the first time they've ever been in the hospital and the only reason they know the hospital is because someone in their family died mm -hmm. in the hospital? Mm -hmm. For like a school age child who has probably experienced death in some way of a grandparent by that point in their life to come into the hospital and know what's going to happen to me. Like my, my grandpa died here. That can be really overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, think about the reason they're hospitalized uh, and based upon their traumas. Again, like we talk about, how can you set up the environment in a way that's going to be safe and elicit joy and processing for the child and healing. Um, also, Kind of understanding that, especially in the role of a child life specialist, understanding that play can be beneficial and can be supportive for a child, uh, children of any age and any experience level. So mm -hmm. you might have a child who comes into the hospital setting and they've never been there before and they're going to go home in two days. That experience can be just as traumatic mm -hmm. as a child experienced the hospital for years and years and years with a chronic condition and they're mm -hmm. coming into the hospital. There are very different circumstances, but every child can have their own trauma in relation to what they're experiencing, whether it's a chronic condition or it's a short term and they need that play and processing. Yes. And, I, and so I think again, this, I'm going to relate it back to the classroom. Every child walks in your door and you have no idea. In many cases, you may have an enrollment sheet that parents have filled out and but you may know you, you may not know if they've had any severe traumas because some people feel uncomfortable sharing that information and so okay so you 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 have to treat every child that walks in the door regardless of a disability regardless of um the situation that brought them there you have to treat each child as a an individual with a different set of experiences so we as early childhood professionals working in group settings need to be thinking about this every time a new child walks in too as well in in this sort of what are they interested in where do they like to play what's their temperament how um how mobile are they? Do they have good mobility? Do I need to make some adaptations in the environment? All of those, all of those things are, are important for every child, but especially in this setting where this might be a temporary 
stay or it might be something that happens on a frequent basis. Absolutely. Yeah. And even then, when a child gets into the hospital setting, wherever they are emotionally or clinically the first day that they're there, mm -hmm. you can blink and the next day will be completely different for them. Of course. And absolutely. there will be other things going on and the caregiver behaviors and caregiver feelings and emotions might be more heightened or it might be better improved. So there's always opportunity to address how the hospitalization and admission is changing mm -hmm. along with the child's feelings and emotions. Yeah. Oh my so goodness. I'm going to um, go ahead and move from assessment into our uh, next category. So the R, I always like to call it relationships and focus in that way. Uh, before, but again, before you can play, you have to assess what's going on with the child. And then you have to build those relationships first. Uh, I've not met a child who, I've not met a traumatized child who I came in and said, here we go, let's play. And they trusted me right off the bat and they were ready to go. I've not experienced that. Mm -hmm. You really need to just take a pause and really um, build a relationship with the child in order to get them out of that sort of trauma um, fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. uh, children and adults, there's just no way to learn if learn and develop and play if you are stuck in the mindset of trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are always, you know, scared, afraid, overwhelmed, your mind is is ready to be triggered at all points. Yeah. How, yeah. how could you sit and, and learn your ABCs or how could you sit and and play with a baby doll with a child life specialist if you don't even trust that person and you're just ready to run every time. <laughs> Exactly. So you really have to take the time to just build that rapport. Uh, sometimes in the hospital, we actually call it staff phobia. Um, so the hospital setting in regard to healthcare and and all the changes we had through 2020 and, and COVID and all of the things really changed a lot of that for us. Um, and it's very scary for a child when the healthcare providers are coming in in goggles and masks and gowns and all kinds of things. How am I supposed to trust you? I can't even see your face. Mm -hmm. um, that is really scary. And again, that's maybe even a little piece going back to the assessment part of what mm -hmm. trauma is too. When we think about the way the world has changed in the last few years, that child is right at the center of all of those things that have kind of compounded. Mm -hmm. So whether they know it or not, that is a trauma in itself facing changes in the world. Well, so, I think the other... The other thing when you want, and I, I had a childhood injury, so I was in the hospital a lot, and um, I always loved my nurses, but I, I, you know, you never knew. I built a relationship, they built a relationship, but you never knew whether they were coming in to do something that was painful mm -hmm. or whether they were coming in to take your temperature, right? So every time that door opened, you might have been triggered. And so, yeah, it's, it is, um, it, it it is a a definite thing that we need to be aware of when we're working with children who have experienced any kind of trauma and they're not going to trust you immediately and if they do i worry about their attachment right, right. right. <laughs> so, so yeah you're right it's collaboration um is the key key term in regard to building relationships when i work with children who come in that i know they've experienced trauma and I know what their traumas are. Uh, it's every time that nurse comes in and and she has the, I don't know, the blood pressure cuff in her hand. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, let's work together as a team. How about whenever you have, I say to the nurse, whenever you have five minutes, I'm gonna leave some bubbles outside of the room. Mm -hmm. Just go in and blow some bubbles. Don't mm -hmm. bring the blood pressure cuff. Don't have an agenda. Mm -hmm. Just take the time. It's gonna mm -hmm. make it a lot easier for you to show the child that you're a trusting person if you're being fun and you're being light and you don't have this sort of ulterior motive to what you're doing. We know we have to get those things done, but sometimes if we just take that little extra step, the child then starts to, we try to chip away at that sort of trauma um, so that a child will play and will do those things. Um, so collaboration with other staff and then of course, collaboration with caregivers. Yeah. Uh, I... I'm a huge advocate for having a caregiver at the bedside because if I'm building a relationship with that patient, 
mm-hmm. and they're really not trusting of staff, mm-hmm. I'm going to build a relationship with the parent first. Mm-hmm. Because if I do that, when the child sees that the parent trusts me, yes, and then we start to sort of scaffold and, and pull things together, the parent leading the play session with the child and I jump in. Mm-hmm. And then we're all suddenly working together and we're all playing together. And then maybe mom has to leave because mom has to go to the bathroom. My mom has to go take a shower and oh look, Rebecca's here. <laughs> so it's a tiered scaffolded sort of model of play that takes a lot of patience. Um, and sometimes it's not really even, sometimes before I even play and I'm building a relationship, I will sit and I will watch TV with a child. Mm-hmm. I'll sit and I'll watch a cartoon show that they're watching. And I always love when I'm not really sure it's helped or it's changed anything. And then I go to leave the room and the child says, well, well, well where are you going? But well, where are you going? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, you want me to stay? Sure. Those are the keys that you look for with respect to relationships that, you know, a child won't always say it, but if you start slow and you just meet them where they are without pushing, that's when a relationship really starts to develop. Oh, yeah. they, they, they say you don't have an agenda when you walk in the door. And I think that's so important. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's go to T. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so in respect, with respect to the types of play, some of the things that I utilize in the hospital setting, we use a big variety of developmental play, therapeutic play, medical play, um, and, and medical play in order to sort of assess what kind of play the child is really needing right in this moment. This is not to say that you won't use all of those in a day, but um, from time to time, it helps to just build on each of those. Uh, Developmental play is play that meets a child's needs at the age that they're at. It's very normalizing. It brings a lot of joy. It helps to kind of, for a child life specialist, to kind of play and assess what's happening. And sometimes it just gives a child control which is all they really need when they're in a hospital setting and it's stressful and they don't have control of their body and only the doctors and nurses can help them. It's like, I just, I just want this child to have a little bit of control to choose the toys they want to play with, to tell me what my role is, Mm -hmm. to uh, say when they're done playing with that and they want to choose something else. It's incredibly liberating for a child to get, have the control of what they want a play session to look like. And in fact, when you're playing through a trauma-informed lens and a play lens in general, child should have the control. It shouldn't be, as long as the child's safe, it sh- the adult shouldn't be controlling what materials we're playing with and how we're playing with them and making the rules for all the things. As long as we're safe, let the child go. Let them work through those things. Um, and developmentally, it's, it's quite enjoyable. Um, when you well, just, and I think uh, going back into an early childhood classroom, all of those things apply, right? Mm-hmm. Children need to have some sense of agency and control and power over where they play, what they play with, who they play with, et cetera, right? So all of these, because you don't know if the children in your classroom have trauma, you you may see behaviors and you wonder why those behaviors are there. But if we can give children some power and control and choice, I think it will go a long way, whether you're a child life specialist, whether you're an early childhood educator, it, it is, it is a tool in your tool belt to ensure that these things are embedded in your daily routine in how you structure your classroom. I I mean, all of these, need to be generalized everywhere, right? Because this is what's good. Sure. sure. And you know, part of it too, the challenge with play, especially sometimes in the early childhood setting, but I know in a hospital setting is that families are facing so many challenging things that sometimes per a family's sort of culture or their background, they will say they don't need to play. They're too sick. They need to rest, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yes, they do need to rest, but you know, you got to chip away sometimes at that caregiver parent relationship too, and not push Mm -hmm. too hard because you're respecting that, like per their culture, Mm -hmm. they don't discuss such challenging things with children. Mm -hmm. Once you build that relationship with a caregiver in order to then choose what kind of play the child will benefit from, Mm -hmm. they start to get more comfortable in understanding why you do the things that you do 
and why there's really a science to play. Um, well, so. and I think the other thing I just want us to think about um, as an individual, when you're sick or when you're not feeling well or when you're stressed out, sometimes just sitting and resting <laughs> isn't helpful, right? That's yeah. why you know, maybe you turn on the TV or maybe you get a book to read so that you can sort of escape whatever you're feeling in uh, pain or in discomfort and sort of go someplace else in, in your mind, right? And so I think, I think that is the, that's, that's another good strategy for all of us. It's important to recognize that we don't always need to rest. Sometimes we need to, need to be distracted. Mm -hmm. And that's the key to developmental play is that it's distracting and it's normal. You know, mm -hmm. a child, for sure, even if they're not talking about what's happening to them, they are hearing all day, every day, doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, talking about their blood pressure, their heart rate, they're this, they're that, all the things related to their hospitalization when sometimes they just want someone to ask them what their favorite food is. <laughs> you know, like what's your favorite game to play? Um, I have lots of kids who love Uno. That's the reason I say that. Uh, but sometimes it's really helpful and really therapeutic just to be able to, you know, talk about yourself and the normal things that will help you to engage in play. And yeah. so we talked about developmental play. Uh, the other one that I use is therapeutic play. Uh, therapeutic play can be very exciting and, and very fun for a child. I love the creativity of therapeutic play because every child has some kind of therapeutic need. Mm -hmm. uh, one time I worked with a child who really struggled to have the, her IV removed because of the tape on her arm. Oh, mm -hmm. and it was so overwhelming for her. We spent so long taking the tape off and working through that. So the therapeutic activity that I did with her to follow up, we took a canvas and we took some paint and we put um, the nurse's tape shaped to the letter of her name on the canvas. Mm -hmm. While we were doing that, we talked a lot about how sticky the tape is and what it feels like and processed her experience. And then we painted over that tape and we slowly peeled it off to reveal the letter of her name. Mm -hmm. We played made an art project she thought it was the coolest thing because we were just doing art but in between all of that we talked about what that tape really feels like and and what kinds of things were the most helpful for her when we took the tape off and if she had to take more tape off what did she think would be helpful next time mm -hmm. this child was I think about 10 so she did have the verbal and cognitive capacity to kind of process and talk about those things but it age appropriate therapeutic play just to get her engaged in processing her experience and having a sense of agency by saying well next time maybe we could right oh my goodness yes absolutely um, and then the next one um also involves some level of therapeutic play but um we talk about medical play mm -hmm. as a way to assess when we do our assessment we sort of recognize what a child already knows about the hospital environment and if there's any real misconceptions about the things that they see or things that are confusing, that's where medical play really comes in. Um, we use it as a tool to see where a child's at. So you might have a child who sits down with the pretend medical equipment and is taking the, the kit of pretend tools, taking mm -hmm. the syringe and jabbing it into the baby doll's eye. Okay. <laughs> I don't correct that. Oh. I don't say, ow, you're hurting him or ow, what do you do? It's medical play is so child driven mm -hmm. that it's, it's helping us to know what things are triggers for the child. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's quite interesting. You'll have a child who <laughs> doesn't really know what to call a stethoscope. And so they'll say, but what do you call this? And I'll say, well, that looks like it's a tool for the doctors that will help your patient. You know, I, I never say, I don't want to label it. Right. I don't want to tell you. But then once in a while you get some of those adamant kids that are like, yes, but what's it called? <laughs> um, so that's where it can be a little bit tricky. <laughs> but um, medical play gives agency, gives autonomy to a child mm -hmm. to work through what they're working through. And, and we can serve as guides for that uh, in order to 
see what it is they need a little bit more help with and what things they actually have a really good handle on uh, in regard to the the medical world uh, and per their age. So sometimes I will just use pretend medical play equipment because that's what makes the most sense. But other times you have a child who they already know like what a oral swab is. They've had used an oral swab a million times before. Hey, let's use a real one. Or maybe we can use a real blood pressure cuff on the baby doll. If a child has seen that before, they're old enough to make sense of those real materials. Um, but it all comes together in sort of the scope of what the child knows mm -hmm. and what they need to process still. So developmental, therapeutic, and medical play um, are kind of the cornerstones of how we play with our children. Uh, and sometimes, again, that that really varies day to day. I could go in one day and a child really needs therapeutic play. And the next day they're like, Rebecca, can we just play Monopoly? <laughs> yeah, we can do that. You know, I have a, a patient who is just turned three a short while ago and she is here kind of waiting for the next steps for surgery or the next steps for leaving the hospital for discharge. And she is a typical three-year-old, typical three-year-old. So we did a lot of processing. I used the, um, the Mr. Potato Head because she had an NG tube in her nose mm -hmm. and she could not, she would pull it out almost every single day. Mm -hmm. So therapeutically, but more medically based too, we took that Mr. Potato Head and we put the NG tube in the spot that would be his nose mm -hmm. and we stuck it in, took it out. We bent it and we made it flexible. We put a sticker on it. Uh, we do those things a lot to process what it feels like to have that NG tube. Um, okay. But then we also, the other day, she's three and you know she hasn't been to preschool yet. So we read a book about apples and we took some apples and made some apple prints on a tree that's hanging in the hallway now for her. Uh, normalization, developmental, therapeutic, uh, anything that helps a child really be a child. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and again, meeting them where they are and providing some interventions that might help them be able to cope with what it is that's happening because they're able to do it to some something else. If yep. it's Mr. Potato Head or Miss Potato Head or a baby, mm -hmm. any of sure. those. And so again, it gives them that sense of empowerment and it also maybe helps eliminate some of that fear that they may have about a medical procedure. Mm -hmm. Yep, because once you are then you're in the door with play, then they're learning to trust you mm -hmm. also. So first it's the play, the lady who's gonna play with us, the lady who's gonna have all this fun. Hey, you know, she seems like she knows a lot about IVs. Maybe she'll talk to me about it. Or maybe a parent will see, you know, I've, I've met parents before who have said, this is the first time my child has laughed in three months. Oh. You know, like so defeating, but it's also so empowering that like, if I can come in and show this child that they are safe and they are loved, then we can move forward in building that relationship into other things. You know, Rebecca is the only person who doesn't have a, have medical things to do with me as per an agenda or medication to give me or anything like that. Right. I wonder right. if I could ask her or I feel safe with her. Yeah. Maybe she'll help me understand it and maybe she'll bring something I can play with that will help me get over my fear of that. Absolutely. Oh my God, Rebecca, this has been amazing. Um, yeah. And so I think what I'd like you to do in the last like three or four minutes that we have mm -hmm. together is mm -hmm. I'd like you to, to give just like the top, the top three things that are important whenever you might suspect whatever the trauma is that the mm -hmm. child may have had, because there's so yeah. many different types of trauma mm -hmm. that, the top, and I think I probably already know what they are that you're going to say based on sure. our conversation, but sure. the top three things you should do with every child, regardless mm -hmm. of their medical condition, disability. I mean, a child walks in the door, you've never met them before. Mm -hmm. The top three things you need to do. What do you think? What would be the top three? Uh, so sometimes in the setting specifically that I work in, you know, it's easy to immediately get really overwhelmed when you are meeting a family that has a lot of wild cards and a lot of intricate things that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I say you're meeting this child where they're where they are at emotionally, developmentally, 
just be patient with them, you know, mm-hmm. and, and try to remind staff to be patient with them too. Some of these children have been through more things in their life than adults will ever be in their whole lifetime. So mm-hmm. just just know that what the child is going through or has been through is overwhelming and, and try to take a, take a beat and just be patient is one of the things that like, that's how I approach my clinical care, you know, be patient with the rate at which they are comfortable building a relationship with you. You know, sometimes you need to pull back a little bit. Sometimes the child doesn't even need you initially, just need their parent to be really involved. Mm-hmm. So like patient with the parent, parents are learning too, if they've not been in the hospital before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, second thing, um, flexibility and adaptability is key. It is so key. You can go in to do a play session and have all the things that you need. And then that child is throwing up and not into wanting to play. Right. <laughs> you know, they, they don't need to play right now. Or you can go in and have all the things ready. Uh, and then you realize that, you know, I didn't see in the chart that the child actually can't move their left arm right now because of the injury that they have. Mm-hmm. How can I adapt this? Be flexible for the things that you don't know are going to happen before, during, and after a play session. Mm-hmm. Um, and just be be open to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last thing that I do think is really important as a clinician, as an educator, check in on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, we see so many things every day that are very overwhelming. And, you know, unfortunately, but fortunately, in the sectors that we work in, we kind of can become desensitized to those mm-hmm. things in order to address whatever those play needs are for children who've experienced trauma. Um, take a breath for yourself sometimes because it's hard. You know, there are yeah, a lot right. of things that we see on a day to day that not a lot of other people do see um, right, or right. understand. And so I think that it's key to, we, we metaphorically say, to continue to fill your cup. Mm-hmm. You know, if oh, you well. Are, you know. well, and I think that what you're describing is vicarious trauma, you know, so firefighters, police officers, nurses, doctors, um, emergency room folks, um, and a, a whole list of other people, social workers, you know, all have this vicarious trauma based on what they've seen. And you're right, it can, it can impact the relationship that you're trying to build, but it's not your fault. It's what what you've experienced, just like it's not the child's fault. It's what they've experienced. So you do, you have to forgive yourself. You have to do things that refill your cup. Mm-hmm. And you you just have to recognize that what is important is this child and how this child is feeling and if they feel safe, right? Yep. And, and that you're being honest that, with yourself that some yeah. days, if your cup is not filled a hundred percent, connect with your team and say, Hey, I need a little bit more support today with this child. Mm-hmm. Hey, not feeling quite like myself. Knowing those things is going to be really helpful to continually giving as much of 100% as you can to a child um, and their family, especially because you're being mindful of the care that you're providing. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Rebecca. Okay. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to close this out. Okay. Um, so to learn more about IPA USA, please visit our website at ipausa.org. Rebecca has really given us a lot of th- to think about today. So, and think about using her, her ideas of relationships. So it was assessment relationships and the different and, types and of types of play types of play in a classroom with every child. Right. So and you'll notice that her assessments were observation and and listening, right, not taking a test. So think about it. Think about it from that perspective in working with every child, because you never know what may have happened to that child. And it could have been a little trauma or a big trauma because everybody has a different view on the very same thing that happened to a group of people. (laughs) So. Everybody, trauma is individual. It's not a global condition for a significant event. So all really good points. So thanks so much. And and until next time, keep on playing.